Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. John Kelly Profiler here, and welcome. Welcome to our continuing series on the Golden State Killer, the beginning of the end series. And in all our series, all our videos, I have to mention my disclaimer that everybody's innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. With that being said, today what I want to do is I want to take a look at how the Golden State Killer stacks up against a couple of the more well-known serial predators that we've had through history. And I'm talking about Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, and I'm talking about Ted Bundy, both of them from the state of Washington. So this is going to be interesting. Who's the most intelligent? Who has, who's gotten away with the most? Who do I think is the most intelligent? Well, looking at Gary Ridgway, I've got to tell you, I think Gary Ridgway was one of the luckiest serial killers that I've ever come across. Supposedly admitted to 47 murders, but right now it's up to 49. I guess he killed so many, he just forgot. He lost count or maybe he couldn't count high enough. I don't know what the deal is with him. He's trying to throw people off. But Gary Ridgway was a necrophiliac serial killer. That was his fetish. You know, he was a necrophiliac. And he liked to kill women outside. He liked to try to get women to come with him, and they were pretty much all prostitutes. He wanted them to come with him to have sex in the outdoors. That was his ruse, get them outdoors. Sometimes he took some to his house and killed them at his house, then moved them to the outdoors. But Gary Ridgway's focus for having them outdoors was that he could create his own place, his own place that he could return to, a nice, safe part of the woods where he could return to have sex with the dead. And that's exactly what he did. He would lure a prostitute into the car with a $20 bill, get her into the car, the truck, whatever vehicle he was using, and then he was on his way. Now, most of the time, he was very shrewd at waiting to see what prostitute was alone. He never really came up to prostitutes that were together in a group or, you know, that were working the street in a pack. He never did. He pretty much laid back and looked for the prostitute that had left the group, left the other girls, and was walking the streets on her own. That's what his major focus was, and I think that's what helped him get away with it as long as he did. Although the cops were on him pretty quickly, he was one of probably five people that were very uh, major people of interest at the time, and certainly he was right at the top of the list. Again, I, I have to give the Green River Task Force an uh, unbelievable amount of credit. They were on him right from the beginning, but they did not have the physical evidence. As Gary Ridgway went on to murder, like I said, 49 women, that we know of, that's the latest count. I mean, he was able to keep moving his safe place. Once somebody would come across his uh, kill site, um, his uh, murderous area, whatever you want to call it, I mean, at that point in time, he was ready to move on to another site. He had different sites all around Seattle, all around the Northwest up in Washington. And Gary got away with it for a long time. It took 20 years before they were able to get him on DNA. Well, I got to tell you, I think Gary Ridgway was just extremely lucky. And on an intelligent quotient, I got to tell you, he really... Uh, never really impressed me with his intelligence. I feel Gary Ridgway was kind of as dumb as a rock, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, it's the old saying, I'd rather have luck than be good. And uh, it's something this murderous person had. Uh, luck was with him all the way. And then we have Ted Bundy. I mean, you know, Ted Bundy, most notorious, one of the most notorious uh, serial killers in history. We have to look at his intelligence. And, you know, he did have a certain amount of intelligence. He got a degree in college, went off to uh, work on 
uh, a hotline, a suicide hotline. In fact, he worked next to Ann Rule, who uh, never had a clue that he was a murderer. I mean, these guys can really wear the mask of sanity and be very charming, and he certainly was very good looking and charming. And she never had a clue uh, that this guy she was sitting next to was out murdering people or would be going out murdering people. I mean, after all, he's sitting there trying to help people that uh, are suffering from depression and other ailments and are calling this uh, helpline. So Anne Rule, after he got caught, ended up writing a book about him. She worked with him. It was called The Stranger Beside Me. And it was a very, very popular book. Really uh, brought her up to uh, being one of the uh, best uh, writers of true crime uh, in our history. She wrote some really, really good books. God bless her. She's not with us anymore. So anyway, when we look at Ted Bundy, we're looking at somebody who supposedly admitted to 30 murders, but a lot of people believe, you know, uh, put a put a one before that. He could have killed over 100 uh, people, and that, and people didn't realize it. Ted Bundy focused on victims that were not as needy and drug addicted as prostitutes working the streets. Ted Bundy focused on focused on women who we consider to be everyday women like the girl next door. They were women that were not living a high risk lifestyle like prostitution, like the victims that Gary Ridgway focused on. Ted Bundy using his charm and his mask of sanity, was able to talk many a girl around his age, college age, into helping him out and getting them into his control zone. He took two girls off the beach in one day at a lake up in Washington. The ruse he would use with women was to show up with a cast on his arm and look needy and say that he needed help. So did it take a lot of brains for him to use a woman's maternal instincts against her, to use her empathy against her? Maybe, maybe not. But you know, it's interesting to me how a sociopath and a psychopath like that could even think about somebody else having that kind of empathy and those feelings for somebody that's downtrodden and these women did help him. They fell for his ruse. They got into his control zone. And then he would bludgeon them, take them to the woods. And then he would kill them. He would strangle them usually. Some he beat to death. He was also a necrophiliac like Gary Ridgway. His focus was on creating a cluster in the mountains of the Northwest, outside of Seattle, and uh, he went on for quite a while doing this. Eventually, his best thinking got him caught, got him arrested, broke out of jail, went to Florida. His best intelligence there was getting drunk, breaking into a sorority, killing some women, beating up a whole bunch of women, and then running out of the place. And then eventually he killed a very young girl and was pulled over by the police and arrested in Florida. How intelligent was he? Well, I got to tell you, you know, there's a saying out there, any man that's his own lawyer has a fool for a client. So when you look at Ted Bundy's best thinking at court, in court, it got him a date and a seat with old Sparky, the electric chair at that time. Because there's no way he was smart enough to defend himself in a court of law against prosecutors that had the evidence on him that they had. So he eventually got the death penalty. He tried to manipulate in prison for quite a while. Eventually he exhausted his appeals. And then that was goodbye for... Ted. Ted uh, ended up in uh, being executed in Old Sparky and, uh, you know, died in the electric chair. 
Now we have to take a look at the Golden State Killer. We're looking at a guy that probably has more than 55 rapes. They're using the number 55. Probably has more burglaries than 100. They're using the number 100. And probably has more murders than 12 or 13 because he just got charged with a new one, which makes it 13. And then we're looking at a guy that we have approximately about 11 years that are unaccounted for. Where was it? It's hard for me to believe that anybody like this stopped killing cold turkey at around 40 years old. So on an intelligent quotient, I've really got to believe that this guy's a lot brighter than the Gary Ridgeway and he's smarter than Ted Bundy was. I mean, if you look at it, he went to the Navy during Vietnam. He got an honorable discharge. He comes out of the Navy, uses the GI Bill probably. I can't say for sure, but I probably believe uh, that's how it went down. He used the GI Bill to go to college. He went to college, he got a degree, came out of college, and joined the police force. He had to go through the academy. He went through the academy, the police academy, graduated from the academy, and became a cop. He was a cop for approximately six years. So along with having a certain amount of intelligence, he also, I'm sure, being a cop for six years on the streets, picked up some street smarts. All the while, this guy's doing burglaries, he's doing rapes, he's involved in murders. I mean, when did this guy even get to sleep? Because we had a really hard time with him having a full-time job, let alone being a policeman, while all this was going on, looking back at it. Because when you think about it, for the amount of time that had to be put in to finding these victims, stalking these victims, knowing their habits, knowing when their husbands came, when their husbands left, knowing their routine, I mean, this all takes time. This all takes time. How can somebody have a full-time job and still have time to do all this, to do all this reconnaissance, to look at a way in, to look at an exit, to be able to escape and evade, to be able to be so physically in shape that he can do this on a bicycle or he could run. That means he had to spend time working out. Where did he get all this time and have a full-time job? See, the one thing we've also learned over the years is that many psychopaths and sociopaths need very little sleep, very little sleep. It's unbelievable uh, how long and how far they can go without sleep. They can really, uh, they can really go pretty far on very little sleep. Now, when we look at the Golden State Killer and we look at Ted Bundy or we look at Gary Ridgway, we don't have him setting up clusters of bodies. We don't have him having a fetish at, as far as necrophilia goes. He, he had definitely had a fetish. His fetish was bondage. So that we, let's just make that clear. They all have a fetish. When we go back at the Golden State Killer, we see a guy that isn't just after the sex and just focused on his fetish. We're looking at a guy who's interested in not only the power and control and sexual dominance over a woman, we're looking at a guy who's also a thief. This guy was very focused on stealing what he could steal. And he was very focused on making himself at home and eating and drinking whatever he wanted to in the house, having complete control over the house with people either tied up and alive or people tied up and dead. I mean, you know, this, this guy had surveilled it in such a way that he had everything pretty much on a timeline. He wasn't worried about somebody coming to the door and knocking on the door and, uh, you know, messing up his uh, controlled situation. 
So this took a lot of work, and I feel it took a lot of brains. And when you match up the Golden State Killer versus Gary Ridgway versus Ted Bundy, I've got to tell you, the Golden State Killer takes the cake. He wins. I don't believe there was a more intelligent or smarter sexual predator and murderer in the history of the United States. And keep in mind, then he went on to have a career as a truck mechanic for like 39 or 40 years. This guy is very, very smart. And, and it's not only his intelligence, but he's got some street smarts as well. Thanks a lot for watching. Thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate all your feedback. We truly appreciate all your subscriptions. Please continue to subscribe. Please take care of yourself and make it a great day. And stay safe out there.